Okay, so welcome back everyone. Can I check how the volume is first? This vol <laughs> I can turn it up <laughs> if you wish. Yeah? Okay. I try my best to speak up. So uh, I hope you had a nice lunch and uh, practice kindness to your tummy and gratitude for the food that you ate. And it uh, seems like people are a bit more relaxed than when they arrived. Maybe a bit more sleepy, but that's okay. <laughs> you have to go through some dullness sometimes. So I'm very happy to see that you're, you are all taking care of your bodies. And hopefully you're warm enough now as well. If not, you have to increase the metta because metta provides a lot of warmth. So this afternoon, it's my favorite subject, which is indeed loving kindness. And this morning we talked about loving kindness more as an intention or you could say a way of relating, a disposition um, that we can apply to our bodies or we can apply to our perception. Uh, whatever arises, we can relate to it with an attitude of loving kindness. So this is a practice we can do in daily life. But now I wanted to talk more about metta as a cultivation. So that means metta as a divine abiding, something that we uh, repeatedly incline our minds toward. So it's kind of like planting seeds is the intention. And then waiting and watching them bloom into flowers is like the cultivation. So we don't have to do very much, but plant those seeds and then wait for them to bloom. Um, but we have to give them the right kind of soil. So that means a mind that is fertile with good qualities like your virtue, like your uh, kind acts of body, speech and mind. And also we have to give them that sunshine, um, that warmth of kindness and patience as well. So that in all weathers they can, they can grow. And we give them space, we give them time. So we can't kind of make the plants grow quickly by pulling them and stretching them because that will just ruin their roots, ruin the seed. And this is sometimes what we want to do in our practice, but it's really not the wise way to practice. So the Buddha said that even if we generate thoughts and attitudes of loving kindness for like a finger snap, then we're already practicing well. But he also said that these um, states of loving kindness can be developed to become what he called the Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes. So these are actually places in our mind that we can resort to time and time again. And of course, the more we incline our mind in the direction of loving kindness, the easier it is to enter those states of Samadhi, what he called the jhana states. So they can be uh, accessed through loving kindness or through compassion, through sympathetic joy and equanimity. And also, of course, through breath meditation. But here we're going to just talk about um, how to cultivate metta a little bit more deeply as access into those deep states of samadhi. So metta not only conditions the mind through repeatedly programming and directing the mind in the right direction, in wholesome directions, um, but it's also the condition of the mind. So I was playing around with this word conditioning. So we want to condition our mind through inclining it time and again towards loving kindness. And as the Buddha said in uh, Majjhima Nikaya number 19, it's called the discourse on the two kinds of thoughts. He said that if we have thoughts of loving kindness, thoughts of compassion, thoughts of renunciation, again and again and again, it will incline our minds in positive directions towards Nibbana, towards liberation. And he also said that whatever we frequently reflect and ponder upon becomes the inclination of the mind. So it's as if you're kind of leaning in a certain way. It's like a tree is growing and you're constantly blowing on it in a certain direction. The wind is blowing, say, from the left or from, I don't know, the south. And that tree eventually starts to turn and bend towards the opposite way, towards the north. You see these kind of trees sometimes on the coast. They're kind of sea swept and they're like leaning in a particular direction. So this is what happens if we consistently try to incline our mind in a certain way, like through thoughts of loving kindness. But then that's conditioning our mind. 
right? So we're de developing wholesome patterns of thinking. But then it changes the condition of our mind as well. So it's like metta is like conditioner for the mind. So just as you use kind of conditioner, I don't have any hair, <laughs> but people here mostly have more hair than me. So just as you use conditioner on your hair to take out the knots and the tangles and to make it soft and smooth, we can use this meta conditioner on our mind to take out those tangles and knots of ill will, anxiety or fear. And so the mind becomes very smooth and very easy to work with, as we said before. So what is metta, loving kindness? And what is metta as opposed to love? Because love is a very common word in our society that we use for almost anything, including things like fries and hamburgers, <laughs> or chocolate maybe is a bit more uh, what everybody here might like. Um, so we say we love these things, but we're really using that word more to mean crave or um, that those things kind of excite our senses in some way. It's not real love. You know, we only like chocolate because it feels good. And the minute we get a tummy ache, we don't like it anymore. <laughs> but loving kindness is something different than that. Loving kindness is a kind of sense of goodwill or a sense of benevolence that is kind and good and seeks others' well-being and our own as well, whether or not we feel in a loving mood. Uh, so it has that aspect of unconditionality about it. And it's also impartial. Yeah, it, it shines on all beings equally, just like the sun shines on all. It doesn't choose, you know, I'll shine on this plant and not on this one. Of course, sometimes in England, there's too many clouds for the sun to shine at all. But generally speaking, when the sun is out, it shines everywhere equally. And in the same way, we learn to develop our kindfulness this beautiful um, attitude of loving kindness in our mind so that it shines on everything. And, you know, whether our body feels good or not, whether we like somebody or not, or they like us, still we endeavor to seek their welfare and benefit. And it also has this aspect of protection. So simply wanting to protect others from harm. And in the suttas it says, even as a mother protects with her life her only child, and sometimes people stop there and they say, oh, okay, so it just has to be like a mother's love. But then the Buddha actually says, so to all living beings, we should cherish all living beings just as a mother protects her only child. So that's the difference there. It's spreading outward and beyond what we consider me or mine. And it's spreading impartially to all living beings. Probably sounds like quite a big ask. <laughs> But if we remember that this is really about benevolence, about giving, about protecting others from harm, then it may be easier to come close to what that could feel like. So we don't have to like people, nor do people have to be like us, right? Another aspect of loving kindness is that it breaks boundaries. It's called Sima Sambeda, and that means it kind of tears down those distinctions between self and other. So whether you look like me or not, whether you're the same gender as me or not, you know, whether whoever you are, whether you're an animal or a human being, maybe even an invisible being, one thing we can know about living beings is that all living beings want happiness, want peace, and seek safety from harm. So whether they're like us or not, you know, these things, these differences are so superficial. And the more we can cultivate metta, boundless metta to all kinds of beings, perhaps starting with a loved person, because that's an easy place to start, but then going outward toward people that perhaps we don't know so well, or we don't have many vested interests with, and even beyond there to the people who irritate or cause problems for us. I mean, there's plenty of those, even if not in your own life, but in the news. <laughs> Yeah, people kind of ruling certain countries, people with different political beliefs. There are so many beings and we don't really understand where they're coming from or why they behave the way we do. But sometimes I feel like, you know, the more harm they do, perhaps the more ignorance is there, right? They're just going down the wrong track and creating suffering needlessly for themselves and other beings without realizing what they're doing. So we can still at least have compassion, even if loving kindness is really tough. 
But we generally start from an easier person and we build up from there. So there's also this aspect of uh, loving kindness that is called appamana. And that literally means without any measure, like mana means to measure. And appamana means boundless, immeasurable loving kindness. So for me, that also carries the quality of like not judging, not judging ourselves, not judging anyone else, because how can we measure another person? How can we even measure ourselves? You know, what are those measures that we use? They're just conditioned by society, by, you know, the way we've been brought up. And that changes from culture to culture as well. So, you know, in some countries, it's completely normal to just say, give me this or give me that. In other countries, you have to say, please, can I have the salt? <laughs> but is it really any different or is it just a different, you know, way of being? How can we say one is polite or one is rude? Because we never know what a person's intentions are. We can only know our own intentions and we can take, try to take care of that. So aspects of loving kindness was the next thing I wanted to discuss, which um, things a little bit more nuanced to this quality of what I would consider really true love, pure love. And one of those aspects is this aspect of giving, as we said this morning, yeah? the aspect of seeking to give rather than to get. And for me, at least uh, in my role at the moment, I really notice the difference when I have many guests coming to my vihara like we have a little monastery now in Oxford and it's just the beginning of having something for fully ordained nuns in this country and I've noticed even just in the first few months and also earlier when we were renting a place that sometimes we have guests who you know are well intentioned but after they leave I feel really exhausted and at other times I have guests who leave me feeling so uplifted and joyful and there's this, diff I think one of the main differences is in people's intention to come. And for some, it's more inclined to what they can get. And for others, it's more inclined to what they can give. And I've really noticed how that makes such a huge difference to the harmony and for the, to the joy, and also to my energy, you know, in the place. So just recently, I think one of them is listening today um, a lovely guest that stayed with me in Oxford and she's on the Zoom uh, part of this retreat. And uh, since arriving, she just clearly had this joy in giving, you know, giving without expecting anything back, but just giving out of wisdom, knowing it's a good thing to do and reflecting on the beauty of giving, both before she would give, during that time and also afterwards. So we did a lot of reflections together, sort of, recollecting all the little kindnesses that you know came from one another and came from other guests and every morning we'd start the day like this and it gave us such a sense of joy because sometimes there's so much to be grateful for in our lives but we simply don't bring it up in our mind and then you know no matter what happens you sort of walk around feeling glum it's like you know somebody could say a really kind word but when we're kind of down on ourselves we just say no 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 that's not true i can't hear it i failed <laughs> and it's such a shame but when we actually allow ourselves to reflect on the on this uh, beauty of giving and and also expressing appreciation for one another it really helps the meta to flow and of course there's a much deeper aspect to the giving which is as i said earlier giving up giving away you know, giving away or at least softening our own self-interest, our own kind of narrow self-centeredness. And I'm sure everybody here is a pretty lovely giving person, but sometimes we do get kind of tight and we become very worried about ourselves, about our future. And at those times we can forget to give. One of my friends actually, a very old Dhamma friend who lives in uh, Montreal, his father was a psychiatrist in, in Canada a very famous psychiatrist, very skilled. And he said that when people came to him with depression, the most common advice he'd give to them was first of all, exercise, and secondly, to go and do some service for someone else. You know, go and do some charity work, go and look after old people, or I don't know, donate somewhere, and, and really find some joy in giving because we can be some, become so obsessed with our own inner world 
and especially fixated on the difficulties in life, that we really forget about everyone else. So this metta really expands our heart and starts to soften those boundaries of self and other so that we can consider the benefit of all. And then another lovely aspect of metta is forgiveness, forgiving. So giving other people the benefit of the doubt, maybe releasing them from their mistakes of the past, the way they've hurt us. But also releasing ourselves from that as well, because it's human to make mistakes and mistakes are where we grow. And then another aspect of loving kindness that I think is very powerful is acceptance. Yeah, just accepting who we are right now. Understanding that this process that we call ourself is basically arisen, generated from causes. Yeah? All the accumulated experiences of our past. So really, we couldn't be anywhere else. We could only be here right now, in this body, with this mind. And yet at the same time, there's something we can do. There's a way we can respond and relate to our minds, you know, that cultivates those wholesome states. So there's no point blaming ourselves for where we're at right now or for whatever we omitted to do in the past. You know, this is causally arisen. You, you made the choices you made with the information you had at the time, you know, to the best of your wisdom and knowledge at that time. But now, where are we now and how do we relate to that? This is how we change the inclination of our mind and in a sense improve our karma, right? So we generate good karma for ourselves. And then another really important aspect is the gratitude that I mentioned before and a sense of contentment. I think these two are very close. And I was feeling a lot of gratitude at lunchtime, thanks to the person who served me very delicious food. And it wasn't even the taste of it that I was after, although that was wonderful, but it was the obvious evident care that went into it. You know, all the little extras that were there, like the attention to trying to find out what I can eat and what's good for my tummy. And uh, it's just so touching, you know, to, to receive in that way, especially when we don't expect it. And so this natural sense of gratitude arose, and I realized that's so close to loving kindness. There was a, a retreat that I went on, I think in 2011, uh, in Italy. And one of my friends donated the costs of the ticket and the retreat as well. And uh, I chose to practice loving kindness for the entire two weeks. And uh, she just came to mind as the obvious person to develop Meta towards. So, I just see her smiling face in front of me and all this gratitude and loving kindness would arise. So it was really, really easy to send loving kindness. But then I was thinking just now, you know, is it only to people who help us and people who are, you know, pleasing to us that we can have gratitude? Is it only to the situations in life that are agreeable to us? Or can we also have gratitude for things that supposedly go wrong? You know, can we have gratitude for the times that are really difficult, that push us to our limits or test our strength? Even if it is really unpleasant at the time, we know it's going to pass and we can learn. Of course, we don't want to invite difficult situations into our life in order to learn. We have enough to work with as it is, at least speaking for myself. You know, I want to follow a path of peace and hopefully a path of ever-increasing happiness and joy. But it's inevitable that we'll suffer and things will go wrong in our lives, maybe sometimes big things, you know, and can we actually have a sense of acceptance, a sense of contentment and even gratitude for that? You know, I've noticed for myself that the suffering I have experienced in my life, generally speaking, has led to a deeper sense of compassion for others, especially others who've been through similar things. Because some things we can't understand unless we ourselves go through them. You know, and at the time, that's the last thing we want to do. But later, you might find you're able to help someone in, a, in the same position as you that you'd have never been able to do unless you'd experienced that. You just wouldn't have the empathy, you know, that understanding that can deepen the metta, deepen the loving kindness and the care. So this is obviously a process and it's not something, you know, that we can just sort of experience overnight but again this is why things take time 
You know, we can't force those plants to grow. Our job is just to continually trust in the process, trust that if we plant the right seeds, the thoughts of loving kindness, the intentions of loving kindness, that eventually that loving kindness is going to become a place you can abide, or at least a place you can repeatedly visit, you know, again and again. So also in the path, I wanted to just bring in again where metta, metta loving kindness comes in the Eightfold Path. <coughs> and to me, the first place it's very obvious is the second factor of the Eightfold Path, which is right intention, sometimes translated as right thought or right attitude. My teacher, Ajahn Brown, translates it as right motivation, which I think goes a little bit deeper. And I asked him actually just this morning, he just got back from Malaysia, he's teaching a lot overseas, and we had a very quick call before I came here, which gave me a lot of metta. <laughs> and, uh, and he mentioned right motivation. And I said, why is that more powerful in relation to metta? And he said, it's more connected to the wisdom aspect. And I, I thought, hmm, how is that? And he said, because of suffering, when we have, you know, the suffering and understand suffering, and that's the first factor of the Noble Path, right view. We understand that there is suffering, it has a cause, there's also a way out. Then we're much more motivated to act through loving kindness. So of course, motivation, relating, intending, it's all very related. But if we're really motivated through wisdom, you know, through an understanding that it's really the only skillful response to suffering, then, of course, it becomes easier and easier to default to that response. And it's also very obviously a part of right effort or right endeavor, as I prefer. And that's the sixth factor of the path. I should say first, though, that the right motivation feeds into the sila. It's feeding into the next factors, which are um, right action, right speech and right livelihood. So obviously, if you're motivated by, motivated by loving kindness, it's much more likely that when you speak, you'll be speaking with loving kindness. You know, your words generally will express your care and concern. Yeah. It might not always happen, but even if it doesn't, people might sense that at least you're trying to come from the right place. You know, you may be not so skillful all the time, but they know that your intention is good. And of course, that's going to translate when it becomes stronger into physical acts, such as going out and serving, giving something of yourself, maybe sometimes giving in a way that you do have to sacrifice some of your own comfort or some of your resources. But you're willing to do that because you want to give and you have this understanding of the joy of giving. Yeah. When we can really tune into the joy of giving, it becomes easier and easier to do that. So it's part of this right endeavor because that is about relating, um, sorry, developing wholesome state. Yeah. So after we have this basic virtue, we're basically good people trying to do our best. We can move that kind of virtue into the mind and look at how we're using our mind. What are we doing with our mind? Is it, you know, generating unwholesome states like ill will, fear, anxiety? maybe resentment or are we cultivating happiness joy peace goodwill yeah so we start to learn to develop these beautiful wholesome states and by doing that it helps to keep the unwholesome states at bay yeah the buddha said something very beautiful and encouraging that when you have thoughts of loving kindness it's impossible to simultaneously have thoughts of ill will thoughts of harm so just imagine that for a moment, you know, that's pretty big. Like just by simply planting in your mind a thought of loving kindness, even if you're just practicing it, you know, almost robotically because you know it's a good thing to do. At least you're protecting the mind from unwholesome states. And at that moment, it's not possible for another thought, an unwholesome thought to arise. So you're keeping out the enemies and keeping in your friends. And after a while, those friends multiply because they feel like your mind's a very nice place to hang out. So you get lots and lots of friends in your mind and then the enemies and the robbers and the thieves stay out. 
So this is one very beautiful way of cultivating right effort. It's not just, well, it's not at all actually about force, it's about the skillful use of the mind and again the skillful use of perception. Because we can always see the negatives in ourselves or in others, but really it depends what we want to look at. There's plenty of positives as well, so sometimes we think that the negatives are more realistic. <laughs> yeah, or we have to kind of figure out what's wrong in order to troubleshoot and improve. But actually, none of it's very realistic because we're just changing phenomena. Like, who is anybody here? I'm sure you're very different depending on your mood, depending on your state of health, what's happened to you during the day. You know, different qualities will come to the fore. So why can't we focus on those beautiful qualities that we see in ourselves and that we see in others? And tell other people about what you see, the good stuff. <laughs> so, it's very much tied in with the path and the right effort or the right endeavor precedes right mindfulness as we discussed before. So earlier on we were discussing how that kindness, when it pervades the mindfulness or the mindfulness is imbued with kindness, it's more powerful as a kind of way to overcome ill will. So you can see here that we've already been cultivating lots of loving kindness before we even sit down on the cushion to practice. And of course, it'll be much more easy to have that friendly, warm relationship with our body and mind. And then, of course, metta can become a samadhi state. It can be a vehicle towards those deep states of stillness, the eighth factor of the path. So it goes all the way through in this way. And the Buddha even said that, you know, we can develop a lot of wisdom through the practice of loving kindness by also understanding that those states of loving kindness, those deep states of samadhi are still conditioned they're very beautiful states, they're very less fabricated states than states of ill will that are built on so much of a sense of self, a delusion of self. So there's a great freeing that happens and a lot of letting go, but still they're impermanent, they're conditioned and subject to change. So when we have insight into that, then that's really deep wisdom and that can help you know, to actually lead to the liberating insights that free ourselves from suffering once and for all. So that may be a little far for us now, but at least uh, the metta can be very helpful. And one other um, important way that it's mentioned in the suttas, I'm not sure if it's directly mentioned as loving kindness that can help, but there's this really wonderful sutta called um, the simile of the salt crystal, or it might be the lump of salt um, in the Anguttara Nikaya. And in there, the Buddha says that um, depending on your state of mind, whether your mind is kind of brittle and small or hard, as we said before, or whether it's vast and, and expansive, our past karma has a different effect. It manifests differently, right? So just to give an example of that from my own experience, I had this experience with somebody who was very aggressive to me and even physically violent. And for many years, I was quite traumatized by this right? Quite understandably so. And this same person said to me, you just have to develop metta. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, that's really a tough ask because actually after this happened, I didn't want to remember this person very much at all. I felt like, you know, by doing that, it would relive the trauma that I was still suffering from. So I kind of trusted in my intention to forgive and in my capacity to eventually feel that loving kindness. But I decided to set that aside and just practice a lot of loving kindness in general as part of my um, meditation, because it's something I really incline toward. And I was doing a retreat at Gaia House many years ago. It was like a self retreat. And uh, I was practicing with the loved person and the metta was coming quite naturally, quite spontaneously. She's like my childhood friend, somebody who really represents unconditional love to me. And uh, the metta was flowing and I was feeling very expansive, very happy. And the mind was large, you know, it wasn't a state of jhana, but it was a state that was very pleasant. It was, uh, you know, a lot of acceptance, a lot of relaxation in the mind. And then this person who'd hurt me just came up into my mind. And it was almost like if you could sort of visually depict 
how it felt. It was almost like there was this sort of beautiful wave passing through me and she just jumped into the flow. And it had absolutely zero impact. <laughs> Whereas in the past, when, you know, the thought of her would arise, there'd be a kind of a little bit of a, a bang or a shake in the mind. And this time she just fell into the flow and it, it didn't either increase or decrease in strength, but it just continued on. And after that retreat, I realized I could now think of her without any kind of shaking in the mind, any kind of trembling in the mind. And this is a little bit what the Buddha meant, because the simile he gave was that it's like you've got a glass of water and you put a big lump of salt in that glass. You know, this is the small mind, right? Which is kind of tense or worried or stressed. You put a big salt, salt crystal so something happens. Maybe you're stuck in traffic and poof, the water's horrible. It tastes really salty. You can't drink it to quench your thirst. But if you put that same salt crystal in a very huge lake, like a freshwater lake, and in this case, that's a simile for the mind, then you don't even notice the salt is there, right? And he said in the same way, you know, if some old comer comes up, maybe thoughts of something you've done wrong or something that's happened to you, like in my case, and it arises in that big kind of lake of a mind, then it has very, very little residue, very, very little impact. And so in this way, you know, we can overcome some of the sticky karma of the past simply by, you know, cultivating the quality of our mind. So in the suttas, it talks about metta, of course, as an antidote to ill will, but also as an antidote to fear. And I think that's quite interesting because many of us might suffer from time to time from anxiety or, you know, nerves or yeah, just that feeling of dis-ease. And I've noticed actually since the corona pandemic, we've been doing a lot of online retreats. And before the pandemic, there were, I don't know, maybe 10% of applicants who were suffering with depression and anxiety. And during the pandemic, especially towards the end, it went up to something like 80% of the people that would register on the retreat. They'd be saying, you know, I'm having a lot of anxiety or I'm feeling depressed. And metta is just such a wonderful way to not overcome these things, because we have to be careful not to want to zap them away, but to learn to embrace and be with those more afflictive or difficult, disagreeable emotions that we experience from time to time. And I think it's very nice. I mean, that's one of the reasons I shared that is because I think it's always quite validating and reassuring to know that Many people feel just like us, you know, again, it's not a personal thing. It's sometimes just a product of the times, right? A product of all the various situations that we have to go through where we struggle financially or emotionally or fin yeah, in whatever way it may be. Um, and for me, I also had to work with quite a lot of anxiety um, this year when some issues went down on my trust on my board and it was really interesting for me because I was going through this anxiety in a public place while I was on a retreat with lots of spiritual friends, luckily. And uh, I said to my teacher, this is a bit embarrassing because, you know, I'm supposed to be like inspiring. I'm a nun and I'm a teacher and I've just been on a long retreat and now I'm having all this anxiety, you know, and what will people think? And he said, no, it's inspiring. People will think you're a human being. And I was like, wow, that is such. <laughs> I touched the microphone. Have I turned it off? It's gone red. Okay. <laughs> Kindness to my microphone. <laughs> and I thought, okay, that's a challenge. So I had to turn around and see the retreatants walking past with a face which was red, obviously crying my eyes out. And it was amazing, you know, I just said to them, yeah, I'm having a hard time. I've got this anxiety coming up. And it was really extraordinary to see the response. You know, people didn't belittle me for that. They said, maybe that's obvious, you know, but when it's you, it's not obvious. <laughs> they said, oh, what can I get you? Can I get you hot soya milk? Or can I get you dark chocolate or cheese? Because these are the only things we can eat. Monastics can eat after noon. And uh, every day they did this, 
And not only that, this is a group of Singaporeans in Perth who come every year for the retreat. They've known me for many years, so they've seen me not always like that. <laughs> But um, by the end of that retreat, not only were they genuinely kind and accepting, they started inviting me to come there to teach and saying, you know, we want you to come on like a seven day teaching tour in Singapore. And over there, you teach a lot of people at a time. At least my own teacher teaches 4,000 at a time. And I was like, I don't think I can do that. And they're like, no, no, it's great because, you know, you can just connect with people. And sometimes I reflect on that, you know, when I'm going through a difficult time that it makes you human, it makes you relatable. And then you can share some of the ways that you went through those things. So that loving kindness in that case was the loving kindness sort of as a recipient, allowing myself to receive that kindness and care, which was really very healing because loving kindness does have a healing power. So, you know, even here where you're supposed to be in silence and, you know, eyes downcast, you are allowed to smile. And I have seen a couple of people doing little things for each other, like making sure someone has a blanket or, you know, making sure they get their cushion and you haven't taken their cushion away. So, you know, we can do this. We can cultivate that feeling of safety, that feeling of mutual respect. And this is so conducive to relaxing and letting go in our practice as well. So how do we practice loving kindness? and I want to um, do a little guidance, but before we do that, um, I'll just give a, a small overview because the way I like to start um, is to choose some phrases of loving kindness that resonate for me. So there are lots of phrases you can read about in books, um, such as, may I be happy, may I be well, may I be safe, may I be at ease, free from danger, contented, at peace. But what I think is really important is to choose the phrases that really resonate for you. So what is it that you most wish yourself? You know, maybe it is contentment or peace. Maybe it's safety. Maybe it's health. Just keeping it simple. Um, and these phrases, we kind of plant them in the heart. So again, it's like the gardening simile. We want to grow flowers. First, we have to take the seed and plant it in fertile soil. So we plant it in our heart. And we have to have that trust and that confidence that it will grow and to give it space to grow. So in terms of the suttas, uh, and especially developing deep states of meditation, we could also say that these phrases in loving kindness are the vitaka. Does people know what vitaka is? It's like the initial application of the mind. So, for example, in breath meditation, the vitaka would be putting the mind on the breath. So basically coming in contact with the breath. Yeah. So instead of coming in contact with the breath here, we're using a phrase of metta. That's the vitaka. That's putting our mind on an object of loving kindness, just a preliminary object. And then the second factor of deep, developing deep samadhi is called vichara. And that is like sustained attention. Yeah. So we have initial application or initial attention. So like the mind going to the breath and then sustained attention, which would be the breath staying with the whole breath, like continuously, even if it's only for a moment or one breath. Another simile in the suttas is that vitaka is like the striking of the gong and vichara is the the resonating of the gong, yeah? So here in loving kindness, the vitaka is the phrase, the resonance is the space between each phrase. So we're going to say that phrase like planting a seed in the heart, and then we're going to give space between that phrase and the next, where we just hold space with kindfulness. We literally watch and wait for that seed to grow. So it's like in that space, you can just listen to the resonance, not of the bell, but of the phrase, because words do have a resonance in the mind and in the heart. So we just listen with our inner ear and there might be nothing particular, but you just, you know, like the sun, like the rain would water the seed, you just listen. And then when the mind starts to become restless or when you feel it needs a bit more direction again, you put in the next phrase. So it's usually fairly quick. We can do a little experiment if you wish. 
So I'll just say one word, okay? And just listen inside between the word. Peace. Peace. Staying in touch with your body. Peace. 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 So what happened to your mind in that space? Did it incline a little bit more towards peace? Hopefully it didn't incline to anger. <laughs> but it maybe just had that little bit of direction to send it in that direction a little bit more. So in the same way we can plant these phrases of loving kindness, something simple, as I said, may I be safe or may I be happy. And I'll suggest these as we meditate. And then what can start to happen once again, not through force, but it, by just repeating this again and again, we can start to experience a sense of piti sukha, which is like happiness, and you could say contentment. That's sometimes translated as uh, rapture and happiness. But it's, it's very much co-joined. So it's a sense of happiness, softness, warmth. It's not necessarily bright lights and bliss but it's just a sense of well-being and ease that starts to grow in the heart. And again, we're not looking for that, you know, there's nothing we can do to force it to arise. And the more we kind of try to make it happen, the less likely it's going to arise. <laughs> because these things arise through that beautiful intention to give, just give to the practice without expecting anything in return. And there's a joy just in that giving. And that joy can start subtly, but after a while it starts to grow. So don't worry if it doesn't come, you know, it, it's just a cause and effect process. The most important thing is you're directing the mind. You're giving it an opportunity to arise. And as long as, you know, you continue along that wholesome direction of thought, it will produce fruits, it will produce flowers in time. So it takes a lot of trust and patience, persistence, also sincerity. You know, we're not kind of, may I be happy? May I be happy? I'm supposed to be happy. You know, We're not trying to force an emotional state. You know, if happiness or well-being is the furthest thing from you right now, instead of that, you can say, may I care for my pain or may I care for this moment? May I relate to myself with kindness and care? Yeah. So really look into what it is that you need and how you want to relate to yourself. We're actually only going to do ourselves for a short time and we're going to focus mostly on a loved person because it's just much easier to begin. Um, but we can just allow those things to grow in their time. And there's no kind of right way or wrong way or good meditator or bad meditator at all in this room okay i'm not a good meditator because i'm a nun and you're not bad meditators because you haven't practiced for a while or because you've never experienced deep states of samadhi all of that is just spiritual materialism and judging it's not a pamana it's not the measureless state so a measureless uh, disposition of the mind one really lovely simile just to end that um came to me when I was in Perth because I spent every uh, Vasa or Rains retreat over there. Uh, it's a three month retreat in the Australian bush and it's Western Australia where this teddy bear comes from. I have to introduce my lovely indigenous Western Australian bear whose name means happiness in uh, the Noongar language, Jerapin. So this is Jerapin. 
<laughs> from Western Australia. And you're all welcome to hog the bear at some point. Um, but anyway, in the bush, it's famous for wildflowers. And uh, towards the end of the rains retreat, which is around October, September, October, it's the spring. And in the spring, all these very unpromising, prickly, scruffy bushes that you've been kind of ignoring and kind of been scratching your legs for the last two months, suddenly they start to bloom. And it's just amazing because they're in these kind of really rocky, it's not even soil, it's just rocks. And they look so unpromising, you know, you never expect that they can produce flowers. And then on one day, suddenly all the yellow hibertia, they're like an Australian buttercup, suddenly they all bloom you know, across two or three days, all the yellow flowers come out. And then suddenly, three days later, all these hiberti, sorry, not hiberti, lechinoltia, these blue flowers start to come out. They're all so unusual, very different from flowers over here. And then two, three days later, all the orchids start to come out, different orchids at different times. And it occurred to me first that beautiful, delicate, fragrant flowers can come from the most ugly and unpromising scruffy bushes, you know, you just can't predict. But secondly, that they all bloom in their own time, you know, and you never can, again, really predict when that is. They bloom according to their own nature. They don't bloom when we want them to bloom. It's not like we can say, I want the pink ones before the yellow ones, because the yellow ones come first. But does that mean that the yellow flowers are better than the blue flowers or the pink flowers? Or does it just mean the conditions are right? So it's just like human beings, you know, it's not that if these people are experiencing this kind of uh, experience in their meditation, they're better or they're more advanced. It's just the conditions at that time produce those results. So this should be very encouraging, I hope, for everybody, you know, just to see yourself as that flower. And all you can do, all your job is, is to just water the flower and take care. Okay? So, no expectation, we're going to cultivate wise thought and the emotion of loving kindness for a little while. If you want to stretch, please do so, but we'll go straight into the meditation. If you're bursting for the loo, of course, you're allowed to go out. <laughs> So once again, taking your time to settle in the most comfortable posture you can find. There's no brownie points for sitting up straight being cross-legged on the ground instead of a chair. So whatever your body wants right now. As long as you're warm, I hope you're warm. And if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes gently. And see if you can establish a sense of kindfulness, mindful awareness, imbued with kindness and warmth. So that your body knows, senses that it's in the friendly presence of the mind. 
Your mind is not going to push your body around or make it perform. But your mind is really a friend to the body. It regards the body with gratitude, with care. So that gratitude and care can manifest as making those adjustments in the beginning of the meditation. Perhaps loosening your clothing or stretching your back, your neck. Loosening any tension or tightness in the face, especially the brow, the jaw. and inviting the body to relax. Sometimes it can help to connect with any part of the body that feels fairly pleasant and at ease, such as maybe the palms of the hands. Unless you've got a headache, perhaps the top of the head or the soles of the feet. And once again, in your own time, spreading kindfulness through the body. from the head to the toes. Just scanning the body for any sensations. Not trying too hard to feel those sensations, but rather just to receive. And letting that mindfulness be like a channel through which your kindness can flow. Reaching every little part, drenching every area of your body with kindfulness. The light and the warmth of the sun. And you can know that it's kindness by the quality of ease that it imparts upon the body. Perhaps not straight away. We're not trying to change any sensations, but rather give them space to be. Loosen any tightness, resistance or clinging. but rather give kindness, acceptance, friendship and warmth. Really grounding in your body, in the sensations you experience in the here and now. And 
and allowing the mind to calm down. And staying embodied, especially noticing any areas once again that feel fairly relaxed, at ease. Maybe there's tingling or warmth, a sense of lightness, or just fairly neutral sensations. or if you're comfortable sensing around the area of the chest, the heart. And with sincerity, tenderness and warmth Invite the phrases of loving kindness that resonate for you. Such as, may I be happy. May I be healed. May I be safe. May I be at peace. Just choosing between two or four phrases that are simple and express your wishes of kindness toward yourself. Trusting in the power of these intentions to incline the mind in the direction of loving kindness, genuine sympathy and warmth. Maintaining that kindfulness between each phrase just listening in the space between the words. Allowing the flower to grow in its own time. And rejoicing in the purity of your intentions of loving kindness, that alone may be enough to bring joy to the heart.
And if it helps to generate the feeling of metta, you can even gently smile as though smiling into your heart. Repeating the phrases, may I be happy, or whatever you truly wish for yourself. And just as in any meditation practice, you may find that your mind wanders away or loses interest in the theme. So if this happens, just smilingly rekindle your enthusiasm for planting beautiful, wholesome seeds of loving kindness in the heart. and simply start again. You're protecting your mind. Creating wholesome karma that will incline the mind to happiness and to true, pure love.
If you wish, you can continue to generate loving kindness towards yourself. It can be really healing, really what you're most in need of right now. Or, if you wish, you can invite a very dear, trustworthy friend or maybe a benefactor, someone you love, to be the recipient of your loving kindness. So choose someone toward whom it's very easy to generate thoughts and intentions of loving kindness toward. A benefactor tends to be someone we're grateful for. Or it could be a friend who you trust, a child who you love deeply, unconditionally, or even a little animal, a pet, So when you think of this person, it should be easy to generate an inner smile. And imagine them, either visually or imagine their presence close by to you. Perhaps as though you're looking into their eyes or sitting beside them. and see what phrases come to mind for this loved person in your life. Phrases that embody your feeling of protection, benevolence, goodwill toward them. Staying in contact with your own body, perhaps the area around the heart. Imagining this person's presence and gently repeating the phrases. Slowly, clearly, rhythmically. Just delighting in the intentions themselves. And listening to the space between each phrase. to the resonance of those wishes in your heart. And really imagine showering this person in those wishes of loving kindness. Relaxing in your presence, their eyes twinkling, maybe they have a smile on their face. As you consistently repeat the phrases of loving kindness.
As you continue to generate loving kindness, you may find you need the words less and less. It doesn't matter either way. But you can just experiment either by dropping down to a basic word like happiness or peace. or widening the spaces between each phrase. Learning to adjust according to your mind at this time. Sometimes when we practice loving kindness, we might meet obstacles to that practice. Maybe the mind doesn't want to engage or thoughts of anger, frustration come up. If this happens, you can either gently persist or simply Continue to practice an all-embracing, kindful awareness toward whatever arises in the mind. So there's never any force to make the mind fit this way or that. But whatever's in need of attention right now, you bring that kind awareness to. Thank <laughs> you. 
In this way, you always progress. Whatever the object of your meditation, the most important thing is how you relate to what's in front of you right now. Staying connected to your body, connected to this being in front of you if you're working with a loved person or to your own body and mind and gently looking into their eyes, thanking them, bidding them farewell for now. Just noticing the effect of the meditation on your body and mind. Learning about cause and effect without judgment, without measurement. But just to learn. How do you feel right now? Were there any obstacles to loving kindness that you encountered? And if so, how did you work with those? How did it feel to incline the mind toward loving kindness? Could you sense the qualities of metta in your body, in your mind? So just taking a moment to connect to any sense of ease, Relaxation, happiness, peace. And appreciating yourself 
maybe even thanking yourself for this opportunity you've given yourself to practice. Whatever the results. Sometimes cause and effect is not immediate. But it should bring joy to know that you've been planting wholesome seeds. And once again, thanking your body for giving you the opportunity to sit in meditation. and thanking everyone here supporting you in this group. May we all be happy. May we be healed. May we be safe. May we be deeply at peace. Good, good. <laughs> so nice to practice metta in a group. I like it. <laughs> Does anyone need a bit of extra metta? <laughs> that means you all really want to hold the bear, but you're a bit shy. <laughs> Maybe? <laughs> anyway, the bear is here. Should you want to accompany the bear on walking meditation. You might have, he might have to accompany you though, because he doesn't reach the ground. Anyway, now we have some walking meditation, a little bit shorter than in the program, but uh, we're meeting in here at half past three for the Q&A, so I suggest about 20, 25 minutes for walking meditation and then 10 minutes for a cup of tea, yeah? So you can bring your, is that allowed? They can bring their tea here maybe for the Q&A? Because <laughs> sometimes it takes half an hour to drink tea. No, they can't? Oh, okay. Okay, so you have to drink your tea earlier. <laughs> Never mind. Whether it's walking or drinking tea, you can try to do it kindfully. If you want to do the walking meditation, which I definitely advise, um, then you may continue as you normally would with loving kindness as an attitude, or you can actually continue the meditation in the same way we were doing just now. One thing that I have done in the past was to gently say those phrases to myself whilst walking. That was all. And that was really powerful. And another time, I pictured at the end of the path this loved person. <laughs> So I'm walking towards them, you know, may you be happy and I'm imagining them there and then coming back, may you be happy imagining them at the other end. <laughs> or I'm just being creative. I don't want to give you too many things to confuse you. You could imagine walking hand in hand, just like with a bear along the walking meditation path and back. <laughs> so as you like, you can also 
Do you matter to yourself? Sometimes that's the hardest, but it's actually the one we need the most. So just see for yourself. But these kind of meta practices, again, it's very much like any other practice. The more we can have continuity with it, the more it will grow. So if you can keep those phrases going in your mind, they don't have to be all the time. They shouldn't be kind of robotic. But just to keep coming back to them, you really are purifying your mind. You're inclining it in a beautiful direction. And you'll be amazed, I mean, over time, you just, they come up when you least expect it. When you're having a difficult moment, you know, you might suddenly have that moment of empathy. Oh, may I be well, may I be happy. So we're programming our mind, reconditioning. Okay, so we'll meet back here at half past. Uh, I'm sure you can all keep track of time. So maybe there could be a bell about 25 past, whoever's the bell person. Yeah, thank you, lovely. And we'll have some Q&A. <laughs>